Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. This show is all about showcasing entrepreneurs who are building businesses in this exciting part of the world. From reading high-level articles about the region, it can be difficult to really understand what's going on. And so my hope is that these interviews somewhat bring it to life, as well as stoking your curiosity to go find out more. On that, do take a look in the archive for more episodes that we've done. But for now, let's enjoy the rest of this funky intro music and then get started with the show. This week's episode comes from Kibera, Kenya's biggest and one of Africa's largest informal settlements. Life is tough here, and many talk about the slum mentality where lack of opportunities leads to drug abuse, crime, and a general sense of despair. Julius Otieno is an inspiration for those in his neighborhood. I'm Julius Okoto Tieno. Uh, I'm a young proactive Kibra resident and the founder of the Africa Social Enterprise. After dropping out of high school, as his family could no longer pay his school fees, he combined the talents of his mother, a tailor, and his father, a cobbler, to make colourful handmade shoes from discarded pieces of African fabric. The shoes are a hit, both with Kibera residents and expatriates, such as myself. Julius and I talk about his story, how the shoes are made, and the impact of the business in reducing environmental waste and providing meaningful employment to the Kibera youth. The, the motivating factor was how best can we engage into activity to clean, bring forth sanitation, and uh, reduce the risk of disease outbreak in the slum environment. We also discussed Julius's trip to Paris after he was selected by an ambassador to present at a trade show there. This involved Julius needing to find the money to get a passport in order to leave the country, let alone have his first experience on a plane. Yeah, it was great, but I yeah. feared the plane. <laughs> it goes so far. Yeah. I, I feared, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. At the end of the day, we are over 300 people on the plane, so that there is, is nothing so. to fear. For more information on the business, head to the show notes where you can find the ReAfric website, www.re-afric.com, as well as a blog post I wrote several months ago about meeting Julius for the first time. That's it www.samfloy.com forward slash shoes. You can also head to the East Africa Business Podcast.com where you can learn about opportunities to help companies like Julius's, whether that be expertise or funding, should you so wish. Anyway, without any further ado, here is Julius. Cool. So we're here today with Julius from Reafric. Julius, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, so, to get us started, can you tell us a bit about uh, a bit about Reafric? Okay, thank you so much. I want some more. I'm Julia Sokoto Tieno. Uh, I'm a young proactive Kibra resident, and the founder of Reafric Social Enterprise. So, uh, Reafric simply means redoing it in Africa. Uh, the mission behind the innovation uh, was, I mean, motivated by us being after restoring the original natural state of Africa as a continent. And uh, generally, Reafric drives three concepts in our social innovation as a social venture. One is waste management. Uh, as you know, generally in Kenya, uh, both county and national level of our government, uh, they are overwhelmed with taking care of waste. And this one is very dangerous to environmental pollution. Um, majorly in the informal settlements, as a pure example, Kibera Slum, where I've been uh, growing since childhood. And uh, the motivating factor was how best can we engage into activity to clean, bring forth sanitation, and uh, reduce the risk of disease outbreak in the slum environment. And uh, in due process of waste, I mean collection uh, with the engagements uh, uh, with the youths and the local county government over here, Reafric thought it wise part uh, of this waste could be reused to do something tangible. Mm -hmm. And that is what inspired the innovation of shoe production whereby we engage into the shoe production uh, of unique different type of shoe style designs that embrace the nature of Africa and the culture of uh, 
the population of Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, we collect waste uh, like uh, fabric. We call mm -hmm. them kitenge atta, the cut off pieces uh, from the various existing tailors within the slum. Uh, we also collect like uh, suede leather jeans mm -hmm. uh, from the carpenters. As we know, there are a lot of carpentry. Yeah, they often use a lot of those things. Yeah, and then doing it. Okay. Yeah, which we collect. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, we'll go through sort of some about how it's made, but but sort of fundamentally. Um, you're making shoes from waste material that yeah. otherwise would have been discarded or, or burnt. Indeed. So we make these shoes out of waste. Mm -hmm. And uh, apart from waste, we inspire the uh, job creation to the rendered jobless kind of youths that are, I mean, in the slum. So we mobilize them, those that have expressed their passion into the artwork, we train them and give them work. But by now, the skill artisans that are confirmed work, and the, at the end of the day, they get uh, paid, and this mm -hmm. uh, through sustainable development goal agendas in the whole world, we ensure we improve on the livelihood of That's our employees. And 20% of the profit we generate out of the shoe we sell, uh, we uh, plow it back to offer scholarship to the bright needy children. As you know, like the informal settlement of Kibera and general Islam communities, uh, there are so many existing bright needy children who cannot afford to pursue their career dreams due to lack of school fee support, since even getting three meals a day at the table in their family is a big deal, mm -hmm. which is just about a dream to each and everyone. So we try to mobilize them, and uh, after we've interviewed them and confirmed their performance and their seriousness with pursuing their career dreams, we offer them scholarship, mm -hmm. of which uh, the business sponsor their school fee. Very good. Yeah, so, right, so there's a lot a lot happening um, with Reafric. So we'll, if you're here, we'll sort of go, go through a few of the different Parts. Um, so, perhaps just to sort of give give some context, when did you begin to do this enterprise? This enterprise, uh, before I officially gave it a full thought and uh, full attention, so to speak, I began it when I was in Form 2. In Form 2? And so, how old were you then? I was in Form 2 2013. Mm -hmm. 2013, I was. Uh, 17 years old. 17 years old, okay. Yeah. So when you were 17, okay. Yeah. And, and, and for context, you, um, so you grew up in, in Kibera? Yeah. This is the um, informal settlement sort yeah. of in the centre of Nairobi? Yes. Um, so you, you were doing, so you were in school? Yeah. And then Form 2, age 17, you decided to look at and do that. Why, did, why was it at that time you decided to look at it? Uh, uh, generally, uh, I'm a victim of uh, uh, those that have gone uh, through the struggle of life in the informal settlement of Kibera. So like, uh, I didn't have school fees to support my, my education at high school level, that is Form 2. And uh, by then my parents uh, quitted whatever they were doing in the city and retired back in the rural at home. So I had to remain alone to ensure I achieve my career dreams. And uh, uh, to them, they didn't have anything to support my, my, my school fees. So like, uh, I thought of how best can I look on to something that can sustain me and I began like hooking the shoes as a hawker. Okay. What does hooking mean? Hawker is like uh, these people that are walking in the street selling okay. stuff. So you're sort of selling, you don't have a shop, but you yeah, just go and sell things. Yeah, uh, yeah I get walking them. Walking around. I, I, I convince the various existing people that are making shoes, then I go and hook. Okay. So from there I realized like the, 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 the products were not working for me. Because yes. uh, it was like a holiday of 30 days a month, like April, August, and December. Yeah. And I have to gather or collect what can pay for my school fees for the next term. Ah, and okay. this one was not working. Okay. Until so I, but why, why was it not working? Uh, there are a lot of uh, these uh, common products all over, of which there are so many hawkers and so many okay. shops. So, so like I could not get you my market well. You couldn't differentiate yeah. because you were just selling the same things. As yeah, the same right? things that I was not even getting the flow of cash. Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, in terms of revenue and profit to sustain me. So like uh, the idea was how best can I venture onto something outstanding that can beat the market mm -hmm. and not more competitive and uh, it will sell with ease and get enough cash to take me to school when the school opens. And that is what drove my inspiration to innovate uh, these unique shoe products that are being made out of different materials extracted from waste. So wh why did you choose shoes? Why, why did you not choose to sell food or to do anything else? Uh, generally, my mother is a tailor. Okay. And my dad was a shoemaker. Oh, really? Your yeah. dad is a shoemaker? My father, yeah. yeah. So 
Ah, I see. So yeah. did, did you did you know how to make shoes? Yeah, I know how to make shoes. So growing up, growing up, yeah, you grew up making shoes, even repairing shoes like yeah. My mom is doing tailoring and uh, she's contributing to the waste emission. Mm. And my dad is making shoes, but do, does not know and have not come to realize that these waste that are being emitted by my mother can be reused really? as raw materials so, to so, make the shoes. <laughs> so the whole life they've been um, doing their current businesses. Yeah. And you come along and said, actually, we yeah, can you want to combine them combine the and bring forth a mutual partnership mm-hmm. among us the various existing this so where did you get because the the shoes they're they're quite i mean they're cool like where did you sort of get the inspiration uh, from? Uh, actually uh i didn't see anything to inspire me but i thought of giving it i had new unique idea that why don't we make shoes out of different material that have never been seen mm, okay. yeah and I say, no, let me make the shoes out of fabric because most of the Africans are after the fabric attires. Yeah. Why don't I also serve their feet with a similar attire they put on? Yeah. And that is how like the fabricated kind of shoe products came so out. Very, very. Um, I should also note for listeners at the moment, um, there might be some motorbikes going on in the background. So if there's a bit of extra sound in the background, that's just what we should, um, should do. Um, actually, let's perhaps talk about it. So we're, we're here in, um, actually we'll, we'll get to that in a bit. So you, you're age 17, you have the idea, you think actually I can you know, start to use these tailored product, you know, the, the offcuts of fabric yeah, into yeah. making shoes. Yeah. And you already have experience on how to make shoes. Yes. What happens then? I, I didn't have the full concept on how best I can bring this uh, dream or innovation into reality. So what I did is like I moved from various existing skill artisans that are working on general shoe industry and I went to pick the professionals or the owners of those small shops and I bring them on board and I mm-hmm. told them I have this new unique product that can supplement and whatever existing shoe product you have can you try it out and we test it if it can sell in the market mm-hmm. and uh, I confronted like 10 and uh, only six responded. Okay. Four didn't respond immediately. Mm-hmm. So when they responded six, because I didn't have the capital or whatever it takes, so like I could like uh, say, can you use whatever you have to do for me this number of pairs of shoes? Then I try to hook, I'll pay you. Mm-hmm. Okay. Are you getting it? Yeah. And through that concept, the first week I did the hooking, I made like four times revenue really? of the normal uh, ones I used to. Mm. have with these normal I mean shoes that are common in the market yeah. are you getting it so I told them these things can sell and that one was within just Kibera and you, and you were you were hawking still indeed exactly so indeed. you went so this is quite smart so so rather rather than trying to get your own make you know make the shoes yourself you just went to somebody else who could make them yeah and you basically said here are the materials yeah. if it sells I'll give you some money. I'll give you some money. If it doesn't sell and it is my time to go back to school, I'll, I'll return for you the shoe. Yeah. Because you're the one who incurred the cost of doing it. Yeah. So, and they, they agreed. Mm-hmm. Of which in due seasons, during holidays, I come back in the, in the slum and I go to them. They do the production, I hook. And I began to save after clearing my school fees. Mm-hmm. Save, save. And uh, uh, I think after Form 4, that is 2014, 2015, I mean, I, I went to Tunapanda. Mm-hmm. Institute to so, so, so by, the, by this time you're how old? Uh, I was 20 years. That is like 2015. So like I, I gained the passion and interest to learn whatever what business means mm-hmm. or what the business world fully entails. So uh, from there I went to Napanda I did basic ICT. And and what, is, what is Tunapanda? One of the various existing vocational uh, institutions within the slum of Kibera that offers free basic ICT training in combination with entrepreneurship. Okay. Who, who runs Tuna Panda? Tuna Panda is owned by Mick and Jay. These are two brothers from US. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is just nearby, uh, within the Olympic Estate. Okay. Yes. What, what, what were some of the key lessons that you learned in that program? Tuna Panda? Yeah. Basic ICT skills, generally in programming, uh, both uh, website and graphic design mm-hmm. and uh, what I enjoyed most was entrepreneurship that is business whatever it entails 
and basic accounting. Very good. Okay. Uh, and how long did this program last? The program is only three months, yeah, very okay. intensive, so to speak, mm -hmm. because you commit it full time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then what did you do afterwards? Uh, what I did is uh, I didn't even give the business a thought still because I, I was fearful it will be a struggle since there was no capital mm -hmm. or whatever it takes to implement the venture fully. So I, from Tunapanda, I went to work in a company called Samasos. Samasos? Limited company. Okay. What, what, what do they do? So Samasos is a technology company based in Kenya that mm, is building on software developments in partnership with the various existing big companies like Google, LinkedIn, Facebook. I see, so it's kind of like outsource. Outsourcing, outsourcing yeah, it is okay. a BPO, business okay. outsourcing business process, out. yeah. Fantastic, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, cool, so there's this, so Samosource is the company and then you joined them, so because you have some ICT skills, yeah, yeah, hand, yeah. you could then go and join them and that's a way for you to earn. And that is how I began uh, sustaining myself after that and uh, they were paying only $200 in a month, mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, and you, you had ambitions for more? Yeah, I had ambitions and more. So like I worked there for two years. Okay. And after working there for two years, uh, I also used to give a behavior change kind of lecture or speech to motivate the youths mm -hmm. because over 80% of employees in summer source were youths. Okay. And uh, the lifestyle of youths sometimes are one thing in a society. So like I used to volunteer and uh, like mentor or nurture the colleague employees, youth that are existing there. Mm -hmm. And I think from there is where I began la realizing my potential and uh, what life means for me. Because most of them were saying, no, you should not be here. You should be, doing, you should be somewhere doing something to our society. Mm -hmm. Most of them, all my friends, even the managers, my bosses, so to speak. And from there, like one day I thought of making the shoes and display to them. To the managers? Yeah, yeah to the managers. Yeah. And uh, they bought the shoes. Really? And they presented the shoes to the, the executive team. Mm -hmm. And they showed the shoes to the CEO of Samasos. She's called Leila Jana. And when she got the shoes, they told me, she told me because she's running a social venture mm -hmm. with a social impact with it. So when I described for her my mission, she like said, no, quit this job. Go and do, <laughs> go and do whatever is oh, meant for you. So the CEO told you to quit your job? Yeah, That's what, right. yeah she told me. <laughs> Yeah, make sure you are supposed to be employing more people, mm -hmm. nurturing more people in the society and impacting life. Okay. So the best thing, don't fix your mind here, please quit the job. I didn't even like hesitate. Uh, I gave it three days, then I quit that job within three mm -hmm. days. Yeah. Okay. They allowed me and I came and launched the social venture fully mm -hmm. 2017 September. Yes. Got it. Yeah. So what did the... Um, what did it what was your life like at the beginning were you is it just you did, did you have other people who could who could help out with the venture uh it has been full of struggle so to speak because i've not yet gotten the the hands both locally internationally so to speak enough hands that can help it and from the beginning i can say like it was a very big struggle because Making a team from the informal settlement to build a company with them is the most hectic thing mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, we began three of us, Peter over there mm -hmm. and Sally, the one making bits here. Yeah. We began three of us. So back in, back in 2017? 2017, September. And are they your friends? Did you know them before? I just knew Peter as a shoemaker who could could make the part of the team who could make the shoe when I was hawking, mm -hmm. then I go and sell. Yeah. But later I came and say, can we now form a mutual partnership together and form a team as a company or a social venture? Mm -hmm. And he agreed. Yeah. Uh, but said he was a friend, even though he's more of Andrew Sandals did work. And he also joined the team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So because there were only two and the business was growing and there were lots of demand. And I will begin like dominating the market by testing the product and confirming the interest of the clients uh, in the market. So like we began now, what can we do to ensure we have enough capacity? Are you getting it? To deliver the demand. Yeah. So, so who, who were the first people who were buying these shoes? Uh, the first people were the local Kibera residents. Okay. Yeah. So other people who were living in, in Kibera? 
you, people you, within the Kibera you'd, you'd go, Olympic. So yeah. I'm trying. I'm trying to picture it. So you, you'd have five a bag of shoes, and you'd go around to different shops and say, "Yeah, would you like to buy these shoes?" Yes, that is how we began. And uh, I used to do sales by myself. Mm-hmm. So like I could do go and talk to various people and showcase the product. Go to various function when I'm my address like crazy African plus my feet. Mm-hmm. When you, que- you question about it, I, I directly to the shop. Then you place an order, we produce and deliver to you. So people around are uh, very well conversant and aware of the products mm-hmm. because they were the first. I mean, I market. Yeah. yeah. And w- what were you calling them? I used to call them sick shoes, sick. Is in like that sick? Sick, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, so like. <laughs> To attract the attention of a client or a customer yeah. who might, I mean, uh, diminish you or like deny you chance to communicate or sell uh, your idea or a product to him or her, say, no, have you ever heard about sick shoes? <laughs> oh, no, sick. You want my feet to be sick? Yeah. No, they are made out of waste. So, like, you know, we extract that which can negatively affect the society. We use it as a raw material, and now we do what? We make the shoe out of it, and that is how people began to entertain and enjoy. Ah, very good. Okay, so that was um, those were the first few months. What, yeah. What was the next sort of big break for the company? The big break uh, was now end of 2017, 2018 February. I joined Somo mm-hmm. project. Yes. Now Somo gave me the full knowledge of whatever entrepreneurship fully entails. Mm-hmm in line with the, the concept of social innovation. And after joining Somo, they gave me a funding. Mm-hmm. That is after three months or so intensive kind of training. Sort of a bit of time to, to explain that the Somo project is uh, an organization in Kibera yeah. where they, people come, people like yourself come with ideas. Yes. And it's, it sounds a bit like this Tuna Panda, where yeah. it's Tuna Indeed, yeah. and program, or how long it is. But they, they have taken you through how to have an idea and, so with 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 the Somo, oh, if I can differentiate it uh, from Tunapanda, mm-hmm. Tunapanda just give you the skills and then they can either help you look for job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Somo ensure that whatever they nurture you is a venture they believe in, and at the end, eighty percent of people that have gone through their program mm-hmm. are invested in. I see. Yeah. So it's much more about almost a, an incubator. It's like yeah. a, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I should note that we're actually doing this interview in in the Soma, in the Soma project okay. container. Yeah, these are Soma project yeah. containers. Yeah, so, so the the, yeah. the, pro- the the office is like a, a shipping container. Indeed. And um, so we just said hello to Amelia and the, uh, the people who run it. And yeah. They've kindly let us use their Indeed. their uh, shipping container up here. So yeah. So like they won't offer you the working space to offer meetings generally want to do your stuffs, yeah, and this is why this, I mean, container spaces are existing here. Fantastic, okay. So you got onto the, onto the Soma project um, program. At the end of it, you get investments. I got so a small grant. Small grants. yeah. So, so that sort of allows you to, to do start. some of the things. Yeah, yeah like the, it was 185,000, no. 185,000 Kenya shillings. About $2, that is one, $2,000. Yeah, $2,000. Yeah, so close to $2,000. So, like, that is what I used to buy the two machinery you see there. Yes. And the small grinding machine. Mm-hmm. And there are so many various existing tools, equipments, and even few shoe molds. Mm-hmm. I used the very grand to purchase them. Right. Yeah. So, after the same project has been completed, at, at this stage, who, who is who is buying your shoes? Like who else are buying the shoes? Uh, generally, in partnership with some more projects, uh, I have been uh, in a good position to have an exposure to not only in Kibera, not only in Nairobi City, not only in Kenya, not only in Africa, but uh, globally. That simply means like uh, uh, we manage to make a website, mm-hmm. create our social media pages and Twitter handles, so to speak, whereby we can now uh, speak about our brand products to the world. Mm-hmm. And those that have uh, interest or are uh, after to get their shoes, uh, they communicate further. 
and then we negotiate on how we can do the production and deliver all over the world, mm -hmm. uh, whereby we segment our market to be both local and uh, foreign. Mm -hmm. And uh, we target, uh, our main target are youths, uh, age, I mean, uh, 15 to 14, mm -hmm. who are uh, passionately and much more interested in the shoe products, more so in the current trending fashion design crazy world mm -hmm. yeah so like we go to university students too mm -hmm. to market the products and even in the various occasions that we apply to either pitch we have also various existing exhibitions in kenya mm -hmm. uh, which we attend and showcase our products yep. and even the clients who walk in the tourists to come to kenya and sometimes find their way to Kibera mm -hmm. Slum and they can pass by the shop, get curious about the product and pop in to Inquamo and even buy. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say even the SOMO staffs, uh, the SOMO board members and generally the network, the mm -hmm. entire SOMO organization has, even to Napanda. And that is how we get uh, uh, to access our market for the shoes. Mm -hmm. yes. Very good, okay. And so now, that, I mean, now you have sort of these various different channels by which um, people can come and, and purchase your yes, shoes. Yes. Um, so if we look at the, you know, when when you first started, it was all quite informal, and it was you had Peter who was making the shoes, um, your other friend as well, and you were out hawking. What what does the operation look like now in terms of the production of shoes? How how is that? How would you explain that? Uh, I can start by saying, I mean, like, uh, when you were three, now you've grown to be 15. Okay, so you're, Full, fi so you're 15, 15 full-time pro, pro, full uh, producers. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have another 12 brand ambassadors mm -hmm. across the world. Mm -hmm. And some of you are part and parcel of our brand ambassadors. Mm -hmm. As I saw you telling a nice story of our brand products in your website. Uh, you are part and parcel. So, like, there are volunteers who are like can tell a story or can share the, the experience with our product to their network, which as a real freak we are not accessible or not aware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that one, like, and also we have like uh, I can say uh, small people, a few people will do like hawking, mm -hmm. and those that we are in partnership directly to. I mean, accept our shoe products in their shops as a supplement product to their, mm -hmm. I mean, footwear products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are part and parcel of the team, which make it to be 42 in number. Very good. But okay. the active shoe producers are 15. People working, so 15 people yeah. every day. Yeah. And and what, what are those 15 people doing? Are, are the majority of them making the shoes? Yeah, all of them are making shoes and shoe making is in different stages. Okay, so all, I, I'm, I'm really interested. So all, all of all of these shoes you make are from hand, but so from scratch, right? Yeah. You mean, so what are, you, how many different types of shoe do you make? Uh, we have like, uh, I mean, kind of five different types of shoes. Okay. We have the official leather mm -hmm. for the official attire in the African nature. We have the Maasai sandals, and we have the toughest back to school leather. Mm -hmm. And now we have like the fabricated ones mm -hmm. type. And now we have a mixture design. Okay. A mixture design can be either leather and fabric combined, mm -hmm. or suede jeans combined, mm -hmm. or like uh, jeans on its own, pure. So these are different designs from sure. the normal for we, we began with. Yeah, so there are like five different types. Okay, yeah. and then w within, for example, the fabric, yeah. there are different styles. There's, you have men's shoes, ladies' shoes, yes. some with heels, some with boots, yeah. etc. Mm -hmm. um, okay, well, and then I mentioned the, the the actual fabric that you get on it. So you, within within it, yeah, there are lots and lots of different options for what the fabric can be on the shoe. Yes. All right, the, 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 these are the these are bits of fabric that would otherwise be thrown away yes. from, from tailors. Yeah. So yeah. how does that work? So do you, do you sort of send people out to go to different tailor shops and, and see what fabric is available? Uh, we give it different approaches. We have like cleaner programs that are currently organized by the inspiration being driven by Re Africa mm -hmm. in partnership with the various existing organizations and uh, 
the local county government as at now, I can say they have a hand in it. And I see the Nairobi governor Sonko is even currently organizing the cleanup, I mean, kind of forums, Saturdays once in a month. Mm -hmm. So in due process, Riafric now has his a team of 356 youths mm -hmm. who do like daily, I mean, cleanups in different parts of the slum because slum is segmented into different villages, mm -hmm. there are around 13 villages. So you'll find a team this today in Olympic, uh, Fort Jesus, 42, Jamuri, uh, Woodley, I mean, Katokera, various existing small villages. They're like estates, but we refer them as villages because it is an informal settlement where like they do clean up. So we have a team of 356. So out of these 356, each and every team, uh, uh, we have we've segmented them to be like in a team of 50. And they have team leaders, mm -hmm. I would think. So 50-50, that is like, uh, I mean, uh, 350, and then six of them leading this, seven. Mm -hmm. I always, I have my team, I, I, I lead a team of another 50, which make it to be 357. So like, as leaders, we ensure like, these 50 are doing cleanups in the various parts, but with us, we try to talk to the waste emitters, people who throw waste, like these small existing industries. We have so many tailors, almost 1,000 tailors in the slum. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of carpenters. Mm -hmm. You know why? Majorly, these are the cheap means through which they can generate an income. Or like this is like the easiest kind of job they can learn mm -hmm. and adapt to and they will form their small I mean, production site. And they emit a lot of this waste. Mm -hmm. like, Tell us and mist. Uh, tell us also, I mean, uh, I mean, carpenters also need to waste. Mm -hmm. And now, as leaders who lead this team, we go to them. So don't tell me to waste. Package them somewhere, then you come and pick them as waste. Oh, okay. Then do, you, do, you, them. Do, do you pay them for the waste? We don't pay. Yeah, we pay for some of the waste. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. When okay. we do sorting and they yeah. realize this portion of the waste is going to be used as a raw material. Yeah. And generate money with it, you have to pay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, so people, I imagine that would make people more thoughtful about before throwing away something if they know they can Initially, sell. when we began, you were not paying. Okay. But when we go to sell for them shoes, that this shoe is out of this waste you used to emit carelessly, we didn't realize yeah. that they will now demand to sell for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah, they're smart. They're smart yeah. Yeah, indeed. Okay. So we pay for some of them, okay. majorly those that they consider we use as our own material. Okay. And they know how to sort them themselves, put them different from the waste that will automatically go to the dumping site. Correct. Yes. Okay. So you then go and you c collect these things, and then do you, what you take them back to the, to the, the shop? To the shop. To the workshop? Yeah, now. Did you have one workshop? Uh, I don't have one workshop as at now. I have three. Three, okay. Yes. That space is too small. And sometimes yeah. you might wonder why is it people feel that mm. space can only accommodate nine in maximum. Mm. Are you getting it? So like uh, I have uh, three more people like Peter, whom I'm in partnership with. And like I own that one show workshop, but the rest of the two remaining workshops I partner. Okay. I partner in, in terms of like uh, referring the train already confirmed skilled artisan youth to be part of that team and then I give them job. Why don't you own the other two? Why don't you, why, why do you use two other people that you don't, why do you partner? Why don't you just do it all yourself? The thing is we are limited in capital just to set up a fully fledged production capacity mm -hmm. or production space to accommodate the entire team. Okay, so you have to, so at the moment, yeah. you partner with other people and how does it work? Do you say, I'm going to, pay you this amount to produce the shoe? Yes, so, so like, okay. I, when I have orders, I give them. Or when I, because there are a lot of demand of these rendered jobless youths who have passion in artworks. So like, after confirming them, because my space currently is very squeezed, I take them to the team, the, the, the rest of the two, I mean, workshops I'm in partnership with. And I say, no, take these three, skill artisans, put them under you. Mm. 
you though they are subjected and uh, Real Freak is the one who will be cut up for their cost and payment salaries and all that. I'll be giving you order, you watch over them. It doesn't mean I don't like like they I own like thirty or forty percent of the the other workshops. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I have to take few tools, equipment to to make these specialized fabricated shoes mm -hmm. which they didn't have initially before I met them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. And, and are those also near your main workshop? These these two places there. Indeed. They, they're close by. Yeah. Okay. Do you have the fabric? How long does it take to train somebody to be able to make a shoe? It depends. It is a duration of two to four months. When somebody yeah, two to four months, and also like depending like we are training how many. Mm -hmm. so, so let's say you've got four new people. Four new people will take me four months. Four months. Two people will take me two months. Okay. You know why, Sam? I have two sewing machines. Ah, uh, okay. So space will be shared. I see. Which is really limiting. I see. So in order, so part of making the shoes. Yes. Is that they have to be able to use a, sh a sewing machine? Indeed, yeah. They have to learn it. Yeah. They are the theoretical and practical part of it. Mm. Yes. What's the theoretical part? And we explain to you how shoe is being made. The way I was like explaining to you. And now practically, now you will be subjected and be given somebody who is more professional to to handle you. Mm. By you, you see now what he is doing and he is like telling you do like this mm. until you become perfect. Yes. And when people have learned how to do it, do you have like, you give them a test and you say, you know, here is an order, you're going to do this completely on your own. Is that how you know that somebody has the skills to do it? It takes a while to confirm somebody to be a full, professional, perfect skill artisan that won't disappoint with the client or the product. Uh, and this one relies on the more professional people that I entrust this into their hands. So like, we first give, I mean, test. I, I say, make for me two pairs of shoes. I'll put them on for the next two months and I'll, I'll be running errands with them. Yeah. And I'll be, I mean, viewing them and uh, verifying their quality, durability, the mistakes that might cause the defect thereafter. And with the time, as you are being tested on that concept, you improve unto your perfection and you'll be in a position to be even more professional than even your trainer. Very good. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> nice. Um, do, do you find that um, there are many issues with the production? Because I'm trying to think, it, it might be quite, to me it seems that there's, there's quite a number of steps yes. sort of along the way. Is it, is it something where there, there is, things can go wrong? Or like, how, how, do you, how would you sort of think about the production side? Issues might be there in terms of poor coordination, poor communication, and sometimes misunderstanding in the team, mm. of which some you might give an order they fail to deliver. And that is what made me to hire the management team mm -hmm. so that before a final product come for us for verification, the executive team, director, uh, the management team has confirmed, qualified, verified, and uh, gotten the product satisfying to be delivered to a client without any defect. So you're kind of at like quite a good stage now, like roughly how many, if we were to look at like actual numbers of shoes that you're making now, what would you say is like in a typical month, what's like a normal amount of shoes that you're actually making? Around 150. Do you think there is demand for more than 150 shoes? Yeah, I ignore a lot of orders. You ignore them? A lot of why orders. Do you, why do you ignore them? Yeah. Sam, tomorrow you can come from UK and tell me I have a thousand clients mm -hmm. who have paid for it. Okay. But I don't have the capacity to deliver that. Yeah. In terms of the limited machinery tools and equipment. Mm -hmm. And I've ignored that. Also in accordance to the, the urgency of the order. Mm -hmm. Which will not be in a position to deliver. Just talk me through the working capital side of the shoe. So like roughly how much do raw materials cost? Where do you buy them from? Do you have to keep inventory? Okay, we have various existing raw materials from different industries or suppliers. 
like the shoe sole itself is from a different total a total different i mean supplier mm -hmm. because it is a recycled cutter which is a final product which in a return we use as a raw material mm -hmm. we buy it the only thing like through buying it or using it we contribute to environmental conservation and preservation I see. but where, where do you buy it from uh, we have like makena but they are being recycled in uh, the more I call it industrial area okay. nearby the city got it so in within Kenya there is a company that takes old tires yes recycles them turns them into soles yeah sheet. and and so these would need to be so you have various different sizes Indeed. so when you go when it you is a start, sheet like this okay so it's a big long sheet it's always a sheet so oh. we are the people who draw I so see. you see how we smoothen the grinding part yeah, yeah. so like, you know when you cut it sometimes you, are, you cut it big or it was not straight yeah. or uniform you have to grind so that is the purpose of the oh, grinder okay. so you've got that what and so you obviously you need to, well, do, do you need to pay cash for that can you can you buy that on credit on debt yeah, can you get it on that? No, yeah. you cannot get it on that because we've not signed up an agreement and have like a permanent partnership as with our suppliers. When does the customer pay you? Do they pay you on delivery? Do they have to put down a deposit? Uh, clans, uh, we have uh, the percentage deposit mm -hmm. to cover the working capital, yeah. uh, which some hesitate to commit to. Okay. They want a final product, mm -hmm. which is cash on delivery. But the clients with whom we are currently uh, serving, mm -hmm. that's why we have limited orders to 150. We get a lot of orders. Okay. There are people saying, yes, uh, uh, I mean, the upfront fee mm -hmm. to cover the working capital is 75%. Let me comment to this. And uh, the rest of the remaining percentage of the shoe price will commit it on delivery. And then talk to me about the, the machinery. So, so what are some of the, the fixed costs that are necessary in your shoe operation? So you, you spoke about this grinding machine. What, yes. what, what are some of the other things which are important? We have the sewing machine for so making uh, the shoe apple. And you currently got two? Currently I have two, two. but uh, I have like uh, 10 people, 10 employees sharing the two. Sharing it, yeah. There too. Okay. Yeah, so we are a little limited with this mm -hmm. as a fixed, I mean, a capital cost. Uh, we have the grinding machine which I showed you. We need at least five. We have one. That one is the old version manual. Mm -hmm. We've just modified it to be electrocuted. Yeah. So we need like a minimum of five. Okay. And also we have the shoe molds, which is a big uh, kind of uh, threat to us as we are growing. Mm -hmm. In terms of delivering the demand so the shoe molds like we need currently 300 to 500 okay pairs. so with the sewing machines yes so with all of the shoes you you need to do some sewing yes and so every single shoe that you have needs to go needs to have some sewing yes right? yeah but the fact you've only got two sewing machines means that, so it means that you're limited by the number that you show you can make. Yeah. So it does that. So that means that every day, every every hour, there you know there's somebody sat at the sewing machine. Indeed. If you were to, is it? So you currently got two. If you were to get eight more sewing machines, does that mean that your production would increase by four times, or are there other factors which means that that's not the case? Uh -huh. That is the case because. As I know, I have a, like some. I have fifty pending youths who have expressed their interest to be skilled artisans into our footwear industry, but we cannot absorb them because the space is small, the uh, machinery are few. So, like in regard to your concern or question, is like. We need more machinery mm. to ensure people don't share machinery and somebody at the end of the day, an employee delivers the job in accordance to the demand in the market. Mm -hmm. Of which, you know, when they are sharing, somebody is maybe limited. 
are you getting it? And all of them are ever limited with work. Yeah, so there's always always stuff they can be doing. There is like a limitation to deliver the the, the demand. Are you getting it? And that is what makes us to ignore more of the orders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we need like uh, the machinery whereby the number of employees which or whom we've already confirmed Mm -hmm. and are permanently working with us, at least each and every one has his they each, yeah, each have a machine. Yeah. Okay. Tool and equipment to mm-hmm. to help them in operation operating in a harmonious way. And how much does a sewing machine cost? So the sewing machines vary. The normal old version which we have cost seven hundred fifty dollars. Uh, but uh, and the best sewing machine that can deliver the work and do a quality, I mean work, mm-hmm. cost. Uh, Two thousand five hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that is the cost of the currently needed sewing machine with our sensitive, unique kind of mm. uh, shoe product we are making, which we are straining to perfect the quality mm-hmm. and keep on our standard. Mm-hmm. In as far as the competition in the in the market is also concerned, uh, I I will prefer that latest version of the sewing machine to be put into consideration yes so, so how much do these plastic molds cost a pair of shoe molds in kenya cost uh 40 dollars 40 really 40 dollars for just a bit of plastic yeah. sorry i mean it's yes yeah, obviously more than a bit that of is plastic, that is yeah. that is four thousand kenya shillings yeah and that one when i go to buy in bulk yeah like 10 pairs that is my recent purchase Gosh, that's quite expensive. Okay, but but so that's an, so if we look at the the things which are um, limiting the growth of the company, yes, so, sewing machines, yeah. these molds, yeah. and the grinding yeah. machines. Okay, we also have the small things as tools and equipment. Okay, that yeah. which they are invisible, but without them you can do nothing. Roughly, what margin do you make on your shoes? So, like, roughly how much do they sell for? Uh, for uh, a pair of shoe to be complete is twenty dollars. Okay, so twenty, do- and that include inclusive of labour. Yeah, labour fee. Includes labour fee. Yeah, yeah. and uh, I sell it at forty dollars. Okay, so, so you're yeah. making roughly twenty dollars per yeah, shoe. Per shoe, I get. So, like, that is a hundred percent profit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's roughly twenty dollars to get them made, forty dollars to sell them. But of course, if you're selling internationally, you've then got the delivery. Cost as well. Yeah, we, we put the delivery which goes up to eighty yeah. ninety dollars. Okay. Yes. Cool. Okay. And so what, what do you what, what do you see next for the business Julius? What what's um what's your sort of ambition for, for where the business can go? I can say I'm very much hopeful with this social venture because you know, before I could think of even selling the shoe, meeting the world and just getting the profit or investment to expand it and let it grow. Uh, my passion is what is, what does it do or what is the impact it brings to the society? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I see so many youths languishing in the streets, in the slum, engaging into crime activities like robbery, thuggery, destroying people's properties, engaging into riots, being spoiled by politicians. Uh, and this one is being driven by the fact that they are unemployed and uh, they have nothing tangible to keep them busy. At the end of the day, they don't have something to sustain them mm. and uh, they're just hopeless. And you know, a hopeless society is a society that is ready for blood, ready to do something like in the name of or in the, in the, in the, in the, in the name of crime as their means of survival. Mm. Are you getting it? What if not only Real Africa but even the various existing social innovations or institutions. What if we bring these people on board? We tell them life is possible. Realize your passion. Let's help you build on it. And then we acquire you fully in our team. And at the end of the day, this one becomes an income generating activity that is sustaining your livelihood. Mm -hmm. What if uh, we are in a good position to give back by, for example, Reafric offering scholarship to these bright needy children who have very bright future, very sharp 
and can at one point be great people in the society, not only in the slum, not only in our nation, not only in Africa, but at one point in the entire globe. What if we give them the chance by like supporting their career dreams? Mm. Yeah, because most of them are school dropouts and that is what contribute to the high rate of unemployment crisis. These people cannot even, I mean, they're not graduates. Mm. They don't have any skill that can expose them to either job market or can inspire them to initiate something tangible. Are you getting it? Mm -hmm. What if we get hold of their hands and uh, build, help them build on their careers and give them only like, I mean, 10 years maximum. There will be people who are great in the society. Mm -hmm. Somebody can now go and further his or her studies abroad or pursue a career of his or her dream with ease. Are you getting it? Once their foundations are well laid. Okay. What if you are in a good position to expose this unique fancy product to the globe? To the global market, I mean. Mm. Are you getting it? I, I went to France and uh, some, over 80% of the population that I engaged with were interested to buy the shoes. I didn't have any pair of shoes. Tell, tell, let's perhaps talk this, about this a bit. So you, were, you recently went on a plane to Paris yes. and, was, and spoke at a conference, is that yes, right? Yes, yeah. How, how did that come about? Uh, uh, through the various partnerships which I have in, the, in, the, in, the, in, our, in Kenya. So w w within Kenya, you've got a, there's a, you, you partner with the French embassy or something? Uh, I I not, I don't partner with the French Embassy as such. Uh, I am one of the youth leaders in one of the biggest organizations. We call it an umbra, umbrella body, mm -hmm. umbrella body of the social enterprises yeah. in Kenya. It is called Social Enterprise Society of Kenya, CESOC. So I'm uh, one of the founders or co-founders of CESOC because when it was starting, the people who came in. So it has about 100 different entrepreneurs. So the CEO of CESOC always speak about our social ventures in general and those, those that are interested either in buying our product, engaging in partnership or networking in either different way, mm -hmm. they just call you. Okay. So when he, the CESOC went to speak about our social venture in the French embassy, mm -hmm. uh, the French High Commissioner was there. Mm -hmm. And he was the organizer of this summit in France. It is called Pact for Impact. Pact for Impact. Yeah. Okay. So when he came to Kenya, he was looking for two Africans mm -hmm. who can accompany him there. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was a global from different wow, continents. Okay. And when this, uh, he talked about all their 150 ventures, he found an interest to come and see my venture. Mm -hmm. So when he paid a visit in the in our shop and verified everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, he found an interest that I may go and give a speech of this to the world. Very good. Yeah. So, you, was this your first time on a plane? Yeah. How yeah. was it? Yeah, it was great, but I yeah. feared the plane. <laughs> 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 it goes so far. Yeah. So far, yeah. It is crazy. Yeah. 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 So, so far. Yeah. I, I feared, but I enjoyed it. Yeah. At the end of the day, we are over 300 people on the plane, so okay, there is nothing so to fear. You, you can't <laughs> <really get it. laughs> I see so many people enjoying music. Yeah. People are just walking here. Did you, watch the, did you watch a film? Yeah, a lot of films, yeah. yeah. I watched films. Yeah. Yes. Indeed, yeah. It was very great, and uh, to me, it was an inspiring uh, experience, so to speak. Yeah. Nice. Generally. What, what did you think of Paris? Uh, I, uh, I'm sorry, you know, like it was very funny being out of Kenya my first time and uh, my dream had been to be in London, New York and Dubai. Paris was very cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and you, you might be going back again soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to go back. Uh, I've been given an official invitation letter mm -hmm. to go back September. Yeah, yeah because uh, the team which I met are seeing the potential behind the innovation and uh, are considering it to be well spoken or communicated to the world. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the summit which I went uh, in the past was only having a thousand people and this one has 10,000 people. Mm. So with my passion or I mean not even passion, with my vision of dominating the global foreign market, mm -hmm. I thought it was that there are so many different people from different ethnic backgrounds in terms of profession, business-wise, 
government officials, investors, donors, and I'm um, just aiming on how best I can get people whom we come one on one negotiation the table to help me set up the shoe shop across the European, I mean, markets in the major cities. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think uh, that is what is driving me to look on how I can go back. Yep. Uh, even though we are still in negotiation, as I told you. Well, that might be quite a good place to, to finish it, Julius. Um, I mean, th- thanks so much. Yeah, really, really interesting uh, sort of chat all through the whole story from the beginning, you know, the, you starting out, you seeing the idea, all the, the influences you've had along the way, um, the place you're at now where there's great demand for the product, but you've kind of got this limited, limited by the uh, the capital that you've got in the business. So if anyone is listening and they'd like to learn more about the company, they'd like to perhaps buy some shoes or even look at, um, you know, if they can think of any grants that you might be applicable to or perhaps come on as an investor. Yes. What, what is the best way for, for people to learn more about what you do? Uh, we have our website where we have the full information and the product varieties and how best you can either engage mm-hmm. by either buying or contacting us directly. We also have our Facebook, Instagram pages. The, the website is re dash oh, yeah. a f r i c. Yeah, re Afric. That is r e dash a f r i c. Re Afric. Re Afric dot com. Yeah. Re Afric dot com. Afric of Africa. So just put Afric dot com. So that is the website through which once you Google, you'll find us and see whatever we are doing and the product we are making. Yes. And you've got Facebook? We have a Facebook page. It is just Reafric without the, the space, so I can. Yeah. Reafric uh, page. Then Instagram to Reafric. Mm-hmm. Twitter handle is Reafric. Great. Yes. And we'll, we'll link to all of those in the show notes as well. So okay. people can head to the East Africa Business Podcast.com okay. and they can find the show notes for this interview. And uh, we'll link to all those as well as some of the pictures that we've taken today. Well, wow. very good. Cool. Well, Julius. Thanks so much. Thank you uh, so much to Sam yes. for the time and uh, having the passion with whatever we are building on. Yeah. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see show notes for this episode by heading to the new website www.theeastafricabusinesspodcast.com. If you'd like to learn more about the show and the work we do, then you can have a bit of an explore on the website and also subscribe to the various places such as Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and email. Finally, if you felt this was a good episode and you've been enjoying the show recently, then please do consider leaving a rating for the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen. You could also tell a friend who's curious about these sorts of businesses that we feature and indeed if you know of a business that you'd like to be interviewed on the show, please feel free to reach out via any of the channels mentioned above and we'll see what we can do to have an interview and showcase them on the show. In any case, have a great week and speak to you soon.